Good evening, everybody. Happy to welcome tonight General Surgeon, Laparoscopic Surgeon, Bariatric Surgeon, George Crawford, MD. So we'll wait for him to get up in the room. So can I get this brother up in here? Just go ahead and invite this brother. What's up, Ted? Thanks for joining tonight. I'm trying to get my boy up in here for this uh, this interview. Hope everybody else is having a nice night. Let's see. What's up, Lorna Soy? Nice to see you as well. Hope everybody's having a good week. Brother Crawford. <laughs> Taj, what's up, man? <laughs> How you doing, bro? I'm well. You doing all right? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good, man. It looks like you're having pleasant weather over there, man. I mean, I'm in Atlanta, so I'm probably having the same weather as you are. You and A? Yes, man. Dude. <laughs> how, how did I not know that? Well, I knew Marcus know, was in the A. Yeah, but I'm in it. I'm prime time. I'm in Alabama. So got it, got it, on got the it. weekends, I come here, hang out. I um, sometimes work at some of the small hospitals around here. Uh, but see, I'm in A right now. I'm on, I'm off Buford Highway. Dude, man, dude, I wish I would have known, man. I pull up, man. How long are you going to be here? I'll be here all weekend. <laughs> Say less. Say less. <laughs> well, <laughs> for those that are joining the room, uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming George Crawford, MD, my, my classmate from the legendary Olympic class of 1996 at the Morehouse College. How you doing tonight, brother? I'm well. You doing all right? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So tell us, man. Let's just get right into it. Who is okay. George Crawford? Ah, man. <laughs> okay, so oh, we're starting off hard. Uh, <laughs> let's see. If I had to describe myself, I would say I am a... Father of four, Morehouse grad from South Carolina, who was also a general surgeon I, and an artist. Uh, that's kind of how I would sum it up. I heard um, that. You know, I, I you know I always tell everybody I'm just a brother trying to do good. Sometimes that's about all I can do. Man, is that a, hey, man. Was, that a, was that a Saints cup? <laughs> Don't tell you nobody. Tell, man. I said you didn't tell me that before we agreed to do this interview. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, but but you, for those that don't know, I went to college with George, uh, class of '96 at Morehouse. Um, George was out of the, the chemistry department. Is that right, George? Yes, 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 yes. One of the elite few. Yes. One one, one of the elite few in the chemistry department. When the chemistry department. Uh, you know, sported uh, was was proud to, to to still have the legendary Dr. McBay uh, in the number at the time. Is that right, George? Yes, 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 yes. You know, of the and legendary you... Napert Matt McBay um, group of professors who who taught a huge percentage of, of black doctors in the United States and dentists. Um, George, uh, tell us about your your childhood, man. Who were your biggest influences? So. You know, for me, I, I, I'm a little different, I guess, and it's not different. I guess it's probably somebody else's story. But I kind of grew up in a, on a farm in the middle of Aiken, South Carolina. So, right. you know, my parents did a good job of kind of exposing us to the rest of the world. Um, so we would travel a lot. But the majority of the time, you know, when I would get home from school, I would have to go feed cows and have to go feed chickens, fix fences. Uh, do stuff like that, and it's mm -hmm. interesting. I, I think that played into the fact that I'm not afraid of hard work. You know, it's, you know, when everybody says, well, "George, why did you go to medical school?" I said because I didn't want to have to cut grass for the rest of my life and feed cows for the rest of my life. Because if I stayed home, yeah. that's exactly yeah. what I was going to do. And then growing up, uh, I was blessed to have a father that went to Morehouse College. Okay. So that, so that kind of changed. Um, my perspective because you know when we went to when we were at Morehouse Dr. Story uh, not Dr. Story what was the president's name uh, Keith. Leroy Keith yeah Keith so yeah when I first got to Morehouse 
I walked in. They said, hey, Dr. Dr. Crawford, Dr. Keith wants to meet with you. And I'm like, oh, okay. They were like, you're in trouble. I'm like, I, I didn't know what I'd done. And it turns out that I knew Dr. Keith since I was in middle school because I was always really? coming to homecoming with my dad. And Dr. Keith, Dr. Story, they all graduated with my dad in Morales College. Um, like, I met um, – Surgeon General, um, Dr. Satcher, when I was in high school and then went to school with his son, Duraka, who are mm -hmm. inc incidentally from Anniston, Alabama, which is where I practice primarily. So I've kind of always been exposed to the men of the house from an early age. So I always had that example of black men strong, being successful, um, being giving back to the community. And then when you add that to my grandmother who retired twice from teaching. She's 107, still alive. Uh, okay. running, a, running a community center. We kind of always had that experience of giving back to the community. I mean, I remember when I was maybe seven or eight years old, tutoring kids in my grade in math at her community center on the weekends and during school. So, you know, I've just kind of been blessed to have a lot of local role models to where I didn't really have a lot of, um, that's why I called them non-traditional. Cause I just kind of grew up around people that were doing great and I didn't know it. And they just kind of always gave me a little bit of wisdom here and there. And that little bit of wisdom continued to carry on throughout my life. And it's kind of one of those, you know, the one thing that Morales is nice about is you meet so many different brothers from around the world and everybody has a different perspective, but you kind of create a playbook for yourself. You kind of say, okay, um, I know Kwame Manley was into this, so maybe let me look at this. I know uh, Kelvin Moses was into this, so look at this. Um, Andrew Jemerson was into this, so let me look at this. So you kind of just are able to take bits and pieces and create your own recipe book. You know, again, I've been doing that since I was 13, 14, 15, going to homecoming. So I just kind of, you know, that, that's how I build. That's how I built who I am today through those experiences. You know, dude, that, that's such an amazing um, story. And I think it's one that's shared, uh, particularly by brothers of our generation, you know, maybe 10 years up, 10 years down, certainly yes. any year before us. Um, you you um, you may remember um, our departed classmate, DeQuincy Hintz, yes. uh, who was also from South Carolina. Yes. Um, my roommate in college, y'all, was a guy named DeQuincy Hintz from, from Greenwood, South Carolina. And Q. we were all classmates. Q, yes, yes. Um, and I remember, man, um, he was telling me a story you don't know. He was telling me a story about the brothers from South Carolina. This was this was probably freshman year. You know what I'm saying? Um, were y'all in boys' state together or something? Yes. <laughs> we were, come on, man. You bring back old school stuff. That's crazy. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I knew that he had some affiliation with you prior to Morehouse. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's usually yes, boys' state boy for state. people like us. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and, and he was saying that um, a lot of the cats that were going into um, to medicine were biology majors, but that you were a chemistry major. And I was like, chemistry? I was like, word? He was like, yeah, man. He said, man, dude, tight. And I was like, oh, I said, well, you know, I said, did he tell you why chemistry? He said, man, I just fell in love with it. You know what I'm saying? Dude, dude. From your perspective, man, how did you get into chemistry, man? So I had this lady, her name was Miss Andrews in uh, high school. And she probably was 62 years old when she was teaching. She probably retired maybe a couple years after I graduated. And it was just interesting from the way that she taught, I was kind of like, okay, I get chemistry, I kind of get chemistry. And then one day I caught her doing something and I was like, what are you doing? She said, I'm just kind of going through the notes. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Aren't you teaching this chemistry? And she goes, no, I'm just reading the syllabus. Let me know if you want to know something real about chemistry. And she <laughs> leaned in and I was like, oh. I was like, wait, what? So, you know, she kind of just one day after school, I caught her and I just said, hey, so she told me that she was teaching from the same syllabus for the last 10, 15, 20 years, she was like, chemistry doesn't change, it's math, but what you do with chemistry 
that's where the magic begins. So she and I just kind of always started doing labs and just kind of had this whole, um, you know, I already loved math, but being able to see what I could do with chemistry, it really spoke to me, you know, and, and I think also part of it was it was the first time I had a teacher that didn't look like me that invested in me. So I oh, think that, what? yeah, so that, that played a lot into it because, you know, she kind of would, um, you know, she just kind of always watched out for me when she realized that I was really loving chemistry. And, you know, chemistry is beautiful because you create stuff, but you can also blow stuff up and burn stuff and do all kind of destructive stuff as well. So that whole yin and yang, this, you know, chaos and order kind of just spoke to my brain. And I just kind of, I think I've looked at life from that perspective, you know, from here on out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and now the other funny part was I actually didn't know you could get into medical school as a chemistry major. I didn't find right. that out until I met a brother at Morehouse, Kelvin Moses, my rod or die, because he told me, he's like, oh, man, I'm going to be a chemistry major, too. I'm like, what are you doing? Going to medical school. He's like, I was like, you can do that? He said, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. So that'll work for me. Dude. We were so blessed, man, to have so many tight brothers, man. Moses, Moses went into urology, right? Yes, yes, yes. Dude, because you know, I, 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 I used to run with Mike Brooks, and, hey, and uh, he's in Birmingham you know, now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, um, is he in Birmingham? Last time I, last time I, Mike Brooks, I think he was. Last time he was in Birmingham. Oh, okay. Last okay. time I talked to him. Okay. Okay. Um. You decided to go to Morehouse because of legacy or? <laughs> so my dad said, and I quote, you can go anywhere you want to, but your tuition is paid for at Morehouse College. <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> I was just kind of like, you know, at first I, I was kind of yes or no about it. And then I went to homecoming one time at 13 years old. And after that, I was going to more. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't a sale. Oh no, 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 no! It was like I'm going to more house. I'm not even. You know, people say, "Well, my my guidance counselor in high school." She said, "Well, don't you think you need to apply to some other schools?" I'm like, "Nope." She's like, uh, you, "You really don't want to look at Clemson or USC?" I'm like, "Morehouse College." So I, I just, I mean, that's where. I, if I had to camp outside and just sneak in class and just try and get credits that way, no matter what happened, I was going to Morehouse College. So, that, and you know, the funny thing is my brother went, my, you know, my dad went on my, and, and it's a little different because all of my uncles went to Morehouse. Even my uncles that didn't, didn't graduate from Morehouse, went to Morehouse for one or two years and then transferred wow. out. So, so I just grew up around Morehouse men. So, you know, it would have been weird for me to do anything else or go anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, bro. Um, what about your Morehouse experience? Uh, can you talk about a couple of things that, that you treasure the most? Um, so uh, I'll start from the, from the beginning to the end. So the very first person I met pretty much was Kelvin Moses. Uh, never met him before, sat down, we were in summer, um, Summer science. Yeah, we were in summer science. And, you know, we just started talking within two minutes, and they called him Moses. Everybody called him Moses. So yeah. Moses and I just kind of hit, hit it off immediately. And, you know, it was weird to be in an environment where you had people that were your same age that were trying to become something more and had similar values. So with those similar values, there was an automatic connection. And then in summer science, uh, we were uh, hanging out, uh, Aldewan Tard, there was a bunch of us, and yep. uh, a friend of ours that we had just met, he got killed in violence. And you in know, violence? Was, he, no, in, in, the, in Atlanta, somebody shot. Oh. He and some other guys got into it, and Dang. he never got to start that journey. So, you know, we had this instance where, you know, I am enjoying life. I am 
trying to learn and getting ready to meet people that I know. And there's this loss of life in the very beginning. So you kind of turn into, you know, you kind of get this balance that occurs. You kind of say, okay, I am blessed to be here. I am blessed to be able to cherish this opportunity when one of my friends that I just met can't do it. Um, so from that point on, I just kind of looked at life as very precious and said, you know, I have to maximize this. I have to get everything I can out of it because I only got one shot and I don't know when that one shot is over. Um, you know, so, so that's how my morals experience started, you know, and then when everybody else gets there, that 900 deep that we had and it's, you know, zero morals and learning, you know, right from the beginning, we got to learn a song out there doing it in the rain. Um, mm -hmm. And you look around and it's this powerful experience because, you know, you turn around, you know, with the exception of um, Stephen Shiki and a couple other dudes, the majority of people were, were people of color. So you look around and it's a sea of you. It's a, yeah. you know, every shade, every hairstyle, every everything. And you realize that being black in America is not just about you. You know, we cover every shade. And then you start investigating it. And, you know, I met some people that, you know, I never met a brother from Oakland. I never met a brother from um, Louisiana, New York. And you turn around and, you know, these dudes become part of your life. You know, you're talking to Coltrane from New York. And I'm like, why well, this brother got big braids on his head? And you start talking to him about dreadlocks. And, you know, you, you have this ability to experience the lives of others in a safe, a safe environment. Yeah. And, and being able to do that, it just changes your perspective. You, you know, you kind of always have this need to not just look at someone and say, okay, I know who you are. You almost want to always become invested and find out who they are because, you know, there's always a story associated with everybody. So, you know, I, I think being able to learn that life is precious, everybody's different. And then you start dealing with some of the smartest dudes ever run into on the planet you start meeting no guys that, you know you, you're like oh i was valedictorian and turn on so i was too i was too i was too you're like wait a minute what and then you just right. kind of start to humble yourself and then um you meet guys like damani pickett um did you ever yep. meet damani yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i remember damani, he ended up at yale uh yeah. phd cat right yeah. from trinidad yeah. yeah yes yeah yeah so Damani, um, I remember going to Damani's room. I was like, why is Damani always making a hundreds on every test? And then one day I went by his room. You had to, he had to get out of his bed over books. So he just had books, 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 books. He was just a well-read brother. He was smart, but he just read all the time. And, you know, I was like, okay. If you want to do something, you got to put in the work. Now, it wasn't yeah. that I didn't know that, but being able to see the living embodiment of, people putting in the work and reaping the benefits, you know, you know, that's, that's huge. And, you know, because we're people of color, black, we were not, we were in the HBCU. We didn't have to hide our success. We didn't have to hide our gifts. We didn't have to worry about someone saying, Oh, this person is trying to do more. So we need to hold him back. You know, it was really more of an experience of everybody lifting everybody up. So yeah, you always had was. people to support, you know, and, you know, people always talk about joining for turning to sorority for support. You know, that was the interesting thing about Morehouse. It was kind of like. It was so Morehouse. unique. It, yes. it was a fraternity. Yes. Absolutely. In essence. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I felt just, the same way. Yeah. I, I, you know, people always ask me, well, so, so how did you get here? I'm like, well, outside of Morehouse College, I can go through the rest. And I'm like, what? I'm like, eh, it all starts there, you know? And, and for yeah. me, it's not just setting foot there it's growing up in that environment at a young age because like i said all of my uncles went to morris yeah. i love it i love it bro uh it was baked into you yes deep baked into you where'd you go to med school george so after morris i went to baylor college of medicine out in houston texas and i was there for four years um and decided that I wanted to do general surgery. It was kind of interesting. I went and did an away rotation at a small hospital in Cancun. Uh, myself and actually Moses went, both of us went. And okay. 
prior to that experience, I figured I wanted to be a family doctor. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I went down there with him. And Moses is fluent in Spanish, or he was. I don't know if he is now. I shouldn't talk bad about him. But um, at the time, he was fluent in Spanish. And I was supposed to go with an internist, and he was supposed to go with a surgeon. But the surgeon was, he was from, he was from Cancun, but he went to school and lived in L.A. most of his life. And he was fluent in English. And the internist didn't speak a, didn't speak a lick of English. So they're like, we're going to okay. switch. George, you go with the surgeon. Kelvin Moses, you go with the internist. And the, guy, first thing, the guy's first name was Jorge. And, you know, I went in the very first day. And this lady came in his office. And she had a bad gallbladder. I was like, okay, it's medicine. It's cool. Next day, we took it to the operating room. And she had a huge gallbladder. We ended up having to do it through an open incision. You know, I was standing on a stool looking down so I could see everything on the man. There, were wind there was a window in the hospital, so I had to kill flies. You know, so it was kind of weird. And then, but I loved it and, wa and watched that lady on the floor for two or three days. And then a <laughs> week or two later, she came back in his office. And she was like, I feel great. Thank you, doctor. He was like, call me if you need me. And I was kind of like, yeah. Afterwards, I pulled him aside. I was like, man, well, what? And he goes, surgeons fix people. And I kind of said, oh, yeah, I got to do that. I said, yeah, I got to yeah. do that. You know, I was like, I'm trying to fix people. And yeah. from that point on, I knew I wanted to do general surgery. Um, I had to figure out whether it was, I wanted to do surgery. So you know how surgery is. Plastics, you fixing people so that they look the way that they want to look. Neurosurgeons, their outcomes are bad because their disease is bad. So you kind of always have that, am I helping people? Am I not helping people? Um, cardiac surgeons, I just don't, I don't believe I'm more important than everybody. So I couldn't be a cardiac surgeon. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, it, it, it just kind of always stuck with me as general surgery and ended up at Emory for uh, general surgery residency and started focusing on advanced laparoscopic techniques. And I've pretty much just been in love with general surgery and advanced laparoscopic surgery since then. And then went to Anderson, Alabama. I've been practicing there for 17, 18 years. And now, every once in a while, on the weekends, I work in Atlanta. Okay. Um, so, George, um, for those that are not in medicine, okay. what does lap? What is a laparoscopy? George is a uh, George is a a general surgeon, uh, which means that after he got out of medical school, he went to residency for five. It was five years, right, George? Five years. Yes, five years. Five years which is a long ass time. <laughs> it's a good time. <laughs> and it's then, a good time. It is a long time. It's a good time. <laughs> George, but uh, there's a technique called laparoscopy. Can you explain it to the layman, George? Absolutely. So there are two ways to uh, take something out of someone. You either make a big incision and put your hands in there, kind of move it around, scissors, whatever, pickups, take it out, and then you have to close that long incision. It can be like this long. Versus laparoscopic surgery or laparoscopy, we make tiny incisions, usually five millimeters or 12 millimeter incisions, put instrument screw and do it through very small incisions. And then if we have to pull something out, we only have to make a small incision. Um, quicker recovery, um, usually a faster operating room time. Patients have less pain afterwards. And you can do some pretty, we can do very cool stuff laparoscopically. It's kind of transitioned now to where you have some people doing robotic surgery, but realistically, robotic surgery is laparoscopic surgery. Just instead of sitting at the patient, you're sitting at a console on the other side. It's a really cool distinction, y'all. It's really cool surgery. And if you're out there, you know, you already got to be good with your hands to be a surgeon. Um, but to do laparoscopic surgery, surgery, you're literally manipulating two instruments at one time. In, in different parts of the abdomen. So your, your 3D spatial awareness has to be on point. It's just so dope. But in addition to those things, George, you're a bariatric surgeon. What does bariatric yes. surgery mean? So bariatric surgery is essentially weight loss surgery. Um, you talk about sleeve gastrectomy, uh, gastric bypass, anytime someone is overweight and we need to do surgery. The interesting part about surgery weight loss is 
surgery by itself and take everybody, put them in a gap in one great category. It is effective for weight loss 65% of the time, every time. Versus okay. if you look at diets and exercise, lifestyle modification, uh, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, all of it, they yeah. all have about a 5% success rate. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So we do a great job of helping people lose weight. And the problem, though, in the United States is insurance companies aren't invested in patients. They're invested in making money. Did I, was I not supposed to George, say I that? George, I got to ask you. No, 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 no. Hold on, man. You put your finger up. So I didn't know if I was supposed to say that or not. No, no. I just want to make sure I heard you right. Are you saying that trying to lose weight by diet and exercise has a 5% success rate uh, of, of, of actually five? Yeah, you said five, right? Versus versus sixty five percent for for for, for uh, gastrectomies. Yes. What? D yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So so go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make sure so, I heard you right. Yes, sir. Five percent. Yeah. So you know the so being we have a very large population in the United States that's overweight and obese, morbidly obese. That's part of what we do now. The interesting part in general surgery, we have to fix ventral hernias. We have people with peripheral vascular disease. We have um, patients with chronic back pain, osteoarthritis. Anything in medicine, for the most part, is affected by your weight. So what happens is I have patients come to me all the time. They're like, hey, I want to get a hernia fixed. I'm like, well, you got to lose 100 pounds. Well, how do I do that? Weight loss surgery. Oh, I want to get my knee replaced, but the doctor says I have to lose 100 pounds before he'll do my hip replacement, do my knee replacement. Not bari bariatric surgery. So it's becoming part of our everyday practice because we have so many patients that are obese now. And the nice part about laparoscopic surgery, if a patient is overweight, their likelihood of success with the surgery is better laparoscopically than doing it open. So we've kind of, whether you want to or not, if you're a general surgeon, you're being pushed into bariatrics. And, you know, for me, I think, you know, when you tell someone, oh, you know, same thing. When you tell someone, hey, you need to lose weight. How do I do a diet and exercise? You know that's not going to work. I at least like having a tool that can say, hey, if you are serious about your lifestyle, if you are serious about losing weight, if you want to add 10 years to the end of your life, let's talk about surgery. And you'd be surprised how many patients say, you know what, let's do it. How, 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 what's the length of, uh, of time that you can perform that? that procedure, uh, uh, George, incision to close? Oh, 45 minutes. If it's not 45 minutes? Wow, wow. That's, That's really, really average, fast. Now, now, the average, now, the average person probably in the United States is about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But I say okay. about minutes. Okay, the, the average person. I got it, I got it. Hey, so and you're doing that laparoscopically? Yes. George, you a bad boy. I, 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 I do me real well. You're a bad boy. For those that are just joining, if you don't know who you've joined, we're in the presence of, 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 of Dr. Uh, George Crawford, uh, laparoscopic, general uh, bariatric surgeon, and inventor and artist. Uh, we, we all know that, that, that our history, which predates America, is, is full of, uh, of lore, of, of our expertise in artisanal things, as well as uh, feats of engineering and mathematics and science. Uh, as well as music, um, you're no different. Um, can you tell us about uh, some of your artistic impulses? So, uh, so when I was nine, well, my dad was an oceanographer. So that's someone that took what? pictures. Yeah, so he started out as an oceanographer, and then he was a dentist. Um, so he was, we've been introduced to photography probably, I mean, I think I had my first camera when I was eight years old, like a real camera with film and everything. Um, I used to do a lot of photography courses uh, in high school. When I was at Morehouse, I used to do the photography courses at Clark. Uh, really? The dark room I was on. Oh, yeah, I was in the dark room probably 50% of the time my senior year um, at Morehouse just developing photos. I still, I have pictures of uh, Graves Hall and parts of Graves Hall you didn't even know existed just for my senior project uh, at Clark for my um, exposition, but expo well, my uh, exhibit. I, now I remember seeing you walk around campus with a with a camera around your neck, bro. Yeah, 
if, if you go back to your 1990s, our senior year yearbook, I think I took 80% of the pictures in the yearbook that year. What? Uh, yeah. You know, plus, it was a nice little hustle at Morehouse because I could get paid a little money. You know, every once in a while, they needed a photographer for this, that, and the other, a school event. So they would just pay me, and I'd just go take all the pictures. So it, it worked out. I had a little change in my pocket uh, from shooting photos, so that worked out well. Um, and, you know, the, cra the crazy part is when I graduated from Morehouse, I had a job offer – to go work for a newspaper in Seattle. Really? And, yeah, and I was really trying to decide medical school or go shoot for a newspaper because I really love photography that much. So that creativity has always been there since a kid. And, you know, the problem with photography when you and I were in college, Instagram didn't exist. So if you had to, if you wanted to get your stuff shown, you had to find somebody or know somebody at a gallery or luck up and do the same hustle that everybody was doing with sending pictures to Vibe Magazine, Ebony, hoping that they would get a feature. Um, and I actually did get one in Vibe Magazine, and I had, I think, one in Southern Living, and I used what? to have stuff in Barnes & Noble. Yeah, man, I was a photographer all the time in, in college. Dang, man, let's uh, go! So that kind of... Uh, I was always trying to find a way to display my work. And, um, you know, when you're trying to display work, you start looking at cool ways to do it because anybody can put it in the frame. So I started looking at doing it um, on wood, putting it in epoxy, stuff like that. And then that transitioned into me doing woodworking. So then I'm doing woodworking, doing epoxy, making epoxy tables. Then I saw something where I wanted to... Um, do some sculpting. So then I've got into smelting aluminum and making aluminum molds. Uh, so that's working with silicone and alginate and stuff like that. So I just kind of like now I'm working on a project for a guy that wants his hand in aluminum looking like it's coming out of a weight. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. So he can put his state championship rings on and I still do photography. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and that's it. And that's funny. That's how I got into Instagram. Because when I found out Instagram um, existed, and I was like, oh, I can display my photography on this thing called Instagram. And I did that. And then nobody liked my pictures, of course. But then I started posting photos of surgery and videos of surgery. And then that's where it went from there. Dude, that's so dope. That's so dope. So it, was that the genesis of you being involved in the show Stuck on TLC? Yeah, I guess, you know, yeah. So, so, I, post, yeah, so I posted a video of this lady that was, uh, I guess she, she was doing stuff. And, uh, okay. <laughs> and she lost yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw of, that video right, the other yeah, day during, during my research. <laughs> so she lost... <laughs> She lost something inside of her, and I had to go get it. So I posted it on Instagram. They they kicked it off with them maybe two days. I think I got recorded a thousand times or something like that. Um, so I posted it on YouTube, and YouTube left it there. So then maybe four, three or four years ago, somebody called me and they said, "Hey, you know, we're thinking about putting a TV show together. We really like this video. Could we use it?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's fine." I have to ask the young lady, and she said yes. So from that point on, they kind of built, I'm not saying they built a show around me, but they kind of used that video as the building block for the rest of the show. George. Oh, she okay. said yes. She said yes to the drink. <laughs> yes, <sir>. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, so the, the, cra the crazier part was when I was doing the surgery, she was like, can you do it on Instagram Live so my friends can see? It? And I said, no, ma'am. That's how you get your Instagram. You know, I knew enough at the time, man. I was like, that's how you get your Instagram shut down and disappear your, your site to that black hole and no one ever sees you again. I said, but I will record it and I'll put it together and then we can post it at another time. And she was like, okay. So she was 100% cool with all of it. She didn't, she didn't blink an eye at all. 
So I I'm telling y'all, you know, the, the remarkable thing about this interview tonight is that you've just been given an Easter egg. If you go to Surgery MD and patiently go through every post and every highlight, you will eventually begin to understand immediately what we're, what video in particular we're discussing with the young lady and the thing that was where it was uh, not intended to be located. Um, or, so, there's one, or, you, or you can go to TLC's YouTube channel or you can go to my YouTube channel. It's called the Crawford Clinic, or you can do surgery. D. It's on there as well. And I posted one. I posted another one of a gentleman that um, got something else stuck while he was doing something. I posted that a couple weeks ago. So that was interesting. <laughs> that's on my that's on my YouTube. I didn't put it on Instagram yet. I'm still trying to figure out how I can get it on there without getting kicked off. Boy, you gotta love America, boy. I tell you, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so George, um, in terms of experiences outside of your pursuit of art, what do you enjoy doing? Um, let's see. So right now, I'm working with another gentleman, with one, two, three, or four other gentlemen, and we have a company called Modern Surgical Design. So Modern Modern Surgical Design is our parent. Um design company that you know we have three surgical pat four well i guess four now yeah we just finished reviewing paperwork today so we have four patents uh one two of them have been granted one of them is still pending and one of them we're just applying for um and then we have a another company that we're working with it's called um doctor retire and that is for physicians that are trying to get out of medicine sooner rather than later um, just really looking at the logistics of it because, you know, you can't just walk in one day and say, hey, hey, guys, I'm out. You know, you can do that, you know, if you're a uh, work for a company. But, you know, if you've been taking care of patients for 10, 15 years, you can't really just say, I'm out, guys, good luck. You know, there's certain legal requirements or certain um, human requirements to be able to help patients get care afterwards. So I'm working with a company that kind of focuses on that aspect from a um, physician standpoint. So yeah, I, I, dude, I stay busy. I, um, you know, outside of that, and three kids right now. One's in dental school. Uh, she graduated from Spelman uh, two years ago. And oh, you know, hold on, George. Kids. George. Okay, hold on. We not. Oh, let me. No, no. So if your last name is Crawford, you are going to Morehouse College or Spelman College. That's not a negotiation. So you can assume that at some point, the rest of my kids will also be at Morehouse College and Spelman College. George, I can't believe that you got a daughter in dental school, though. We that old? Yes, sir. We are that old. I am. I know I am. I know I am. So, yeah. We the same age. God, exactly. dog, man. So, so, I can only speak for me, but I am that old, yes. Dang, George. Okay. So, George, um, I know you're an artist, man. What are your favorite albums or who are your favorite musical artists so sorry so first rest in peace biggie so always number one biggie small Taurus vig christopher wallace christopher george wallace um then i am a john coltrane fan. if we're gonna okay. you wanna stick to, all right you want to stick i mean we can stick to rap if you want to or we can kind of no 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 no, okay, no, okay. no. Uh, we, we, we went to morehouse Okay. Yes, sir. Right. right. We, we went to Morehouse, so I mean, you know how it go. Yeah. John Coltrane. So I, yeah. So John Coltrane is up there. Um, Etta James. You know, she's one of those that when when I get sad, I kind of pull out you know some of her albums and just kind of go through those. Um, you know, of course. What's your favorite you know, Etta James song, George? <sighs> Besides, at last. Yeah, I wasn't gonna do it last, man. Um, I, I I didn't think that you would. So Etta did. I can't remember the name of it. Etta did this country music song on the last album. It was a blue rose. I can't on that cover. It was a weird, crazy song, but it spoke to me. And and I can't. I can't remember the name off of it. I'll text it to you in a little bit. Um, George, I, I just want to interject, George. I'm a huge John Coltrane fan as well. Are you? Um, you know, so, so they did this little off album. It's called The Gentle Side of Coltrane. It's kind of hard to find. It's a compilation of a couple things. Check it out. Um, you know, and then him and Charlie Mingus did a couple things as well. So, yeah. you know, don't get me started. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. Now yeah. bring it, yeah. bring it, bring it, bring it uh, back a little pseudo contemporary. I believe that Outkast is probably one of their greatest rap groups of all time. I think their ability to mix. They kind of did that whole yin and yang thing. You, you kind of have Andre and Big Boy, two completely different styles that somehow merged them together. You know, the ability to do that, I don't think that's been done since. Um, or right. you could say no, no one was brave enough to do it um, because they stepped out there and uh, just said, look, this is who we are. Accept us. Facts. And, and that's it. Um, and then I got to give a shout out to one dude that turned me on to a jazz version of rap. Remember Guru? Yeah, yeah. Gangstar. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of, I, you know, again, South Carolina, all I knew was LL Cool J, a little bit of jazz, and my parents grew up a lot of mainstream rappers. And then when I got to Atlanta, you know, hanging out with Jalal Slade and uh, uh, Jacob Bentley, you know, you started – looking at Goody Mob, and, and I realized, you know, brothers like um, from New York that I met, you know, you realize that their music was, all, was very vast. So, I, you know, I'm a fan of old school hip hop. I just, I, it, it's just, you know, I will, I will give Tupac a little respect. I'm not a huge Tupac fan, but, you know, I understand the brother struggles and, you know, Shakur went through a lot of stuff. So he always had to talk about him and talk about him. No doubt. You know what I really remember from my freshman year, George? Dude, I remember Mary J's first album, oh, yeah. SWB's first Wait album, yeah. 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 Shantae Moore's first album, the Boomerang yeah. soundtrack, Black Moon, Diggable Planets, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Brand Nubian's uh, yeah. album, In God We Trust. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know What's what I'm saying? Yeah. What's yeah. the 411? Yeah. That. You know, Diggable Planets, again, was one of those that you were kind of like, what are these jokers doing? And then Dude. when you start listening to it, you're like, why isn't anybody else doing this? You know what I mean? It was just a whole... Right. We had that... It was, and, and maybe it was that 92, 96 year that we had where music was different. But like you said, we had all those albums that came out that were just invasive into your soul. Dude. Mike Checker, Daz yes. FX. Yes. You know, uh, uh, you know, they want FX yes. remix. Yeah. Um, dude, uh, I mean, shoot, Mad Cobra. Mm -hmm. that, that was just so much, man. And then you did. You, I assume you lived in Graves freshman year, right? Yeah. So the funny part is, I lived in Graves three out of the four years I was there because I was what? In the, yeah, I was an RA. So. Okay, I, okay, I just, okay. I stayed in Forbes Hall for um, maybe one semester. And then I remember that annex, the little bootleg building behind Graves. So I stayed in that yeah. for yeah. a semester. Yeah. But then the rest of the time, I was in Graves the entire time. I was, I was in Morehouse. For those that, that are not from Morehouse, whenever you see a logo of Morehouse a lot of time, one of our logos, when you see a building, that's the top of Graves Hall which it was actually the building that Morehouse started in, but it's also traditionally where uh, the honor students live freshman year. And my buddy, Ryan Gaffney, you remember yes. Gaffney? Yeah, yeah. What I used to go to Gaffney's adjacent? room. Coffee adjacent, yeah. Coffee adjacent right now. Yeah. I, used to go to, I used to go to Gaffney's room, and we used to listen to jazz. We used to listen to uh, yes. uh, Nina Frilone, Bob James. He introduced me to Lee Morgan. Are you up on Lee Morgan? Okay. No, I am not. Dude, Lee Morgan was a fantastic superstar trumpeter. Man, they actually have a documentary about him on Netflix, I want to say, called uh, They Call Me Morgan. And, okay. dude, awesome. And my, my pops put me up on game, but Brian knew about him. Okay. And, and we bonded. But we just, just listened to jazz albums, cuz. Yeah. Donald yeah. Byrd. And, yeah, and that's the kind of experience that you would have at Morehouse because, again, you had all these brothers that just – we're from all over the place and had different experiences and we weren't afraid to share that with the yes. other people that were around us. Yes. Yes. Th that's what's missing today. I feel George, yes. man, you know, you know, our young people are, are not even aware that, that they have the ability 
and the right to 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 be able to flower intellectually uh right. without any type of uh, of constraint because yeah. we didn't have yeah. any constraints no that's the, no. the good thing about morehouse it was encouraged like you know my immediate crew was was q kevin johnson yes and clint jackson from from uh from dc well yes. from tdac new jersey but he lives T-Nac, in dc yeah. now yes right yeah right. A lot like the rest of the 30 cats from T-Neck that came down our year. <laughs> they, look, they, yeah. all play, they all play football. You know, was they all play like, football. They like, all play football together. I was like, man, you can brought the whole team up here, but okay. All right, I'll see. You know, but, you know, we were all pushing each other. We were all reading, man. I mean, and, and yes. you know, kind of the ethos of, of Benjamin Mays and, 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 and Martin King, but particularly Benjamin Mays, you know, who always encouraged you to travel with the book. Uh, who yep. always encourage you to keep studying and self improving? That that was part and parcel of what we experienced. It was just the norm, man. Get yeah, whatever. Then. Um, yeah, it was, and you, you kind of just you you, you kind of fall into this comfort of okay, it is not only okay to be me, but I don't have to be afraid of whether or not someone accepts. You know, and then once you leave Morehouse and you start going into majority institutions, you still have that sense of self. You still have that sense of I can do me and it's okay. And, and I think right. that's the difference that people always talk about a Morehouse man or something like that. I think it's really more of, ooh, that's bright. Um, I think it's more of a sense of um, knowing who you are and being able to be who you are and being comfortable in doing that. And, you know, you're right. I think a lot of kids today don't have that comfort level. You know, I, whether, you know, my company, Dr. Retire, it may fail. Okay, if it does, it does. But I've learned something from it and I can move on to the next one. I don't take those failures as a loss. I look at them as a learning opportunity and it's information so that if somebody says, George, hey, I was thinking about doing this company. What do you think? And I'm saying, oh, we well, got to do LLC. You got to do this. If you're doing this, you got to decide if you're patent stuff. You got to have PCT. Um, I think if you're trying to do international, if you're not, you can go with the U.S. But the U.S. is a little weird about stuff. So you learn that knowledge in failure. So you're not afraid to fail. You just want to be successful and succeed. And you accept that failure is like that sometimes. Um, but if you are just like, someone's going to beat me down. Someone's not going to let me do this. Someone's not going to help me do this. And you don't have that resource. You know, that's the one thing that nobody talks about at Morehouse is that I see brothers all the time from Morehouse that I didn't go to school with, that I never met before. And they'll say, hey, my name is such and such. I went to Morehouse College. I'm like, okay, you family. Tell me what you need. You know, it's just yeah. automatic. And we have a huge resource um, that a lot of people underestimate. And you can find stuff out all the time. You say, hey, give me a couple seconds. Let me find somebody from Morehouse at that institution. And we can make it happen. So that ability to not worry about failing, the belief in self, and a resource network to help you be successful, you know, that's Morehouse College right there. No, it can't be said better. Uh, Please follow um, George Crawford, Dr. George Crawford at Surgery. Hold on, hold on. Before you recommend, there is a little asterisk. Some of the stuff I post is kind of wild. So just be careful when you hit that follow button. Just know there may be some stuff that you kind of don't want to watch with your kids or you don't want to watch with your grandmother. She's got a heart condition. It can get a little deep sometimes. If you have a queasy stomach, his page is not for you. Uh, He's doing doing surgery on his page. So if that's not your cup of tea, but if you're interested in that, if you watch it on Discover Channel and, and all that type of stuff, it's certainly an embarrassment of riches, as they say, on on uh, Dr. George Crawford's page. Dude, I want to say thank you, man, for taking the time out to holler at no, your boy, place. man. No, always, man. We'll, we'll have to get up. I see them in the A all the time. Absolutely. Dude, now that I know you're coming to the A, dude, please reach out, man. I, my, 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 um, I'm hemmed up this weekend, but any other weekend, bro. No, I mean, I'm here. Literally, I was here last weekend. I'm here next weekend. I'm here the weekend after that. I'm here all okay. the time. We'll okay. We'll get up. Okay. All right. Hey, dude, you have a blessed night. George Crawford, right, MD, y'all.